Welcome everybody to this Tecla Structural Designer webinar. My name is Alessandro and I'll be running you through a demonstration of new features and behaviors introduced in Tecla Structural Designer 2021 with Service Pack 1 installed. We'll start by demonstrating new behavior for grid lines. This is that grid lines are now not selectable by default in uh, 3D views. As we can see, we have a, a grid line that we cannot select. This has been done to allow for a easier navigation of the model without grid lines getting in the way for selection and also to allow for these grid lines to be available in all our review views uh, while in 3D. We can obtain the previous behavior by turning on a couple of settings in the model. The first setting that we want to look at is in the levels. So we're going to select the level that we want to make this grid line selectable, in this case, our base level. I want to turn on show grids in 3D view. Once that is on, we can then turn on the scene content grid and construction lines. This will make our grid lines now selectable. So we can select them and make changes or show the references of uh, members that are referenced to this grid line or delete them if we don't need them. If we turn off either of these properties, then we'll find that the grid lines are now unselectable again. The behavior of the grid lines in a 2D view is unchanged, so we can just uh, select our grid lines in 2D views as previously. We'll now proceed to demonstrate a new review view tool that has been introduced to make working with impulse flow reductions much easier in Tecla Structural Designer. Tecla Structural Designer has always have processes and settings to allow for the application of impulse flow reductions and is able to do this automatically in a majority of the cases for columns and walls. This is off by default in our uh, impulse load cases. So we're going to go ahead and turn this on in the load case uh, dialog. We'll find our impulse load case and we can turn on our impulse load reductions. When this is done, TSD will automatically apply the impulse load reductions to our columns and, and walls. The impulse load reductions are applied as shown in the model settings under impulse load reduction. As we can see, we can see uh, the reduction percentage per the floors that are carried by each stack. So we see that uh, one floor carried has no reduction, two floors is 10%, three floors 20%, and so on. These are determined by the code uh, EC1 equation 6.2. These are not editable in, uh, when working with uh, Eurocode, but they are editable when working to British standards. If we run a quick analysis for our impost load case and review our axial force results, we have slightly loaded this uh, model. We can see our axial loads without reductions, and we can turn on the reductions to see a reduction of our loads. Previously, the altering of the impulse uh, load reductions had to be done using the column or the wall properties. For columns, we could see for columns, we can see the assume extra floor supported. This allows us to add extra floors to any discontinuous columns, such as the ones here in the middle that support a transfer beam, but there are additional floors above that. 
and we can also count the floors that are being supported for a specific level. This is on by default, but it had to be done per column or wall individually for the level. The level that are considered as, considered as floors for the reductions are controlled by the construction level dialog, taking the floor option. This, uh, this portion is uh, unchanged. The new tool can be found in the review view on the show alter state and change into impulse flow reductions. Here we can now graphically see we can graphically see the reductions for our members. We can see that the columns reduce from the top, just a no reduction, then 10 and 20 and so on for the continuous load path columns. So this column has been modeled as a single column and becomes multi-stack as it crosses the floors. And we can see that our columns with this continuous uh, loading path reset where they become discontinuous. So as we can see top of the column here, it starts with no reduction, reduces uh, 10, 20, 30, becomes discontinued by the transfer beam, which is supported by the internal column. And then that starts again in uh, by uh, 0, 10, 20, and 30. Naturally, we will want to adjust this to be able to reflect the additional floors being carried. We can see in the legend, when we're in the review view, we can see the impulse load reduction uh, factor. So this is the factor that the impulse load will be multiplied by. We can change that to the reduced impulse load by, so you can see the percentages. So you can see 0% at the top, then 10, 20, 30, and 40. The easiest way to work with this now is just to duplicate this view so we can have them side by side so we can see what the reductions are in our structure on the right and work on what the reductions are on the left. We can make changes if we set that to set. Now to, for columns or walls we want to assume extra floor supported. So we can see that the entire member property is ticked by default as this will apply to the entire member. So it will increase the floors uh, supported by each stack by one for the member. So as we mentioned for the internal columns, they're supporting additional four floors. So we want to add four floor more as four additional floors. And we can either take a single column one at a time or we can use our selection tools such as a shift line selection to select multiple columns at once. We can see that the reductions are increased for those, co for those columns. Further, we want to set the reductions for beams and slabs. These are not done automatically by TSD, and it's up to the engineer to decide what reduction is applied to these members. So we'll go ahead and change that to the reduce impose loads by, and we can begin to rationalize our reductions for our slabs and beams. We can change the filter type to reflect just slab items so the beams are not in the way. And we can see that, for example, at the bottom, we have a reduction by 40%. So we can change our reduction by 40% and just click on our slab and change the reduction. On the right hand side of our structure, it supports columns that reduce by 30%. So we can make that change as well and click on that slab. On the level above, we see that there is a transfer column so a transfer slab supporting a column. The column is reduced by 20%. So on the left hand side, it's a matter of changing that to 20%. I click on a slab.
now that we've uh, addressed the slabs, we can then also reduce by for our beams. We can change the entity type to a beam. And we can change the reduction to 30%, as it is they are supporting columns that reduce by 30%. The entire member property can be useful here. If you have members that are multi-span and support, and each one supports a column, which in, in this case we do have, we can take this option to select the entire member at once. So we just click on one of the spans and it will apply to the entire member. If this is unticked, then it will apply to just one of the spans. We're gonna tick it, and then we can use the selection tools again to select the three beams and change the reduction factors. If we switch to a results view, we can see the previous results for our structure. So it reduced from 196.4 to 137.5 before we amended the reductions. We rerun the analysis for that impulse load case. We'll see now the further reduction on those of those uh, columns that we have added additional supported floors. So now the reduction it reduces to 117.9. Going back to the review view, we can go back to review. And we can also see the floors are counted as supported. We need to change the entity to either any, so any columns or walls, depending on what we want to review. And then we can see that by default, all the floors are counted as supported. So as before, we had to change it in the properties window, as we showed before. Now we can do it uh, graphically. This is the property for the floor. So whether a stack supports the floor above or not. So if we click, if we want to make these changes, we can change to set. And we have these two options to either count the floor as supported. So when that is ticked, then it will set our members to on. When that is on ticked, it will set it to off. So as an example, as we can see, the entire member will apply to the entire member. If we have that on take, then we can select individual stack ends or the middle of a stack. We can see that as uh, we have turned off all the floors counter supported for this column, the reduction has come down to 30%. The reason is 30% and not zero is because we have provided as, uh, additional floors assumed as supported. So if we change here in the review on the right hand side to number of floors supported, we can see that there's assumption of four for this column and this column is supporting eight. We can see our other columns support eight. Going back on the left hand side, we can revert. So we can see again, eight floors supported. If we untick entire member, we can click on the specific end. So I untick that as well, so we can set it to off. We can click on the end of the column. So the stack ends that meet at that floor will be turned off. So now we can see that there's seven floors at the bottom of this of the corner column. If we take if we click on the middle of the stack, then it'll apply it for the level at the top and the bottom of that stack. As you can see, these are all off. So the number of floors supported is uh, five. We can review the properties of this column. Now we can see that obviously the assumed extra floor supported was zero. And we can see the, the property for the third floor has been turned off as well as the second floor as shown graphically. As we have seen, this uh, imposed load reduction feature 
makes the application of impose law and the review of impose law reductions much clearer and makes it uh, much easier to adjust than the previous behavior in a Tecla Structural Designer. We will now proceed to review a new overall wind drift check that has been introduced with a series pack one. For this, we require a wind model. So we're going to create a wind model for our structure. For this, we require wind panels. So we're going to model some wind panels. You may notice that now we're modeling wind panels. We have this rectangular property in the properties window. This allows us to select just opposite corners of the panel and model a rectangular panel very easily. So we're just going to model four rectangular panels and cover these faces. We can still model uh, rectangular panels as shown here, and we can then change the shape. You'll notice when selecting the blue node that the property for rectangular is also on. This allows you to change the width and height of the panel and keep it rectangular. But if we untick it, then we can change the shape to a polygonal shape as we need for these faces of the model. Similar on the other side, we select the blue node, untick rectangular, and it will allow us to change the shapes of our panel. This tool can make it uh, can provide useful when modeling the panels, as we can just model our rectangular faces and then change it to polygons, or more often than not, a rectangular face is required. This applies to concrete walls as well. So previously you had to model, change the model by selecting each blue node one at a time, but now we find the rectangular option. So we can just select the blue node and change the width or height of our walls easily. We're now going to run a wind wizard for a random sample location in the map and accept the defaults and generate some wind load cases. <clears throat> the overall wind drift is controlled through the design ribbon, then settings. So you can see under the sway and drift checks, we have our previous wind drift check, uh, wind drift check um, properties. Now we have a property to check for resultant wind when this is ticked, Tecla Structural Designer will calculate the resultant deflection of uh, the wind and do the check to, to, for that deflection and the height of the structure or the height that is set up between the two levels with the lowest and highest uh, check for drift property. When the resultant is unticked, Tecla Structural Designer will calculate the deflections on uh, both directions and will report the worst case then ratio. To activate the overall wind drift check, we just tick the box and the limit will appear. We're just going to accept that default and OK. And we need to create some combinations for wind. So we'll just generate the combinations. For this check, only the overall wind drift check is required. So we'll just generate overall wind combinations. I'm going to click Finish and obtain some wind combinations. And we'll run Analyze 3D only. 3D only will run our 3D building analysis and we'll generate those results uh, for design and 3D building, and it will not run FE chase or Gorilla's chase on. It's an advantage where we're concerned about the drift results and stability of our structure. We can run 3D only static, and it will run it for all our active combinations and provide us with results without 
having to spend time or wait for the chase and analysis to complete. Whereas uh, analyze all, as you may be aware, it will also run the chase down analysis if, uh, if required. So now that we have run the 3D analysis, we can see under the design that the overall wind drift check is now available. So we can see the details to see the results. And this will show the combination, the deflection, the height between the highest level and the lowest level active drift check. What this means is that each level has a drift a check for drift properly property. So if we go on to the levels and each specific level, we can see that there's the check for drift property. The class structural designer will use the, the height between the length between the bottom level that has this property ticked and the highest level that has this property ticked that also has a column or a wall connecting to it. If we have additional levels above uh, our structure that has uh, that does not have any columns or walls connected to it, then it will not uh, use that level for the uh, height calculation. We can see the overall wind drift ratio, uh, 332, and the limit that we have uh, set in the design ribbon, and see that the status fails. Just to show again with um, the level eight, if we untick check for drift, the overall wind drift check is updated automatically. So we can see now it's 76. If we look at the details, we can see that the length has been reduced by one level. I close this. And we're going to check again for drift on that level. In the design settings, we can change our limit to, for example, 330. And now we can see that it updates automatically and now it's a pass. As mentioned before, if we insert another level above, but there are, no, and there are no columns or walls connected to it, the overall wind drift remains unchanged for the height. As you can see, it's 28.5, as there are no results for that level. We can see now that this new automated check gives you a quick and easy way to check for overall wind drift for your building. In addition to this, we have also improved the EHF uh, settings. So if we go on the home ribbon, and then model settings under EHS, we can now is we can now see it says global imperfections. Before this was hard coded to a 0.5% maximum as uh, per the code, and in order to reduce this uh, value, engineers had to input the height of the structure and the number of columns in each direction. It is now much easier for engineers to just input the value that they want to use by using the override boxes. This allows us to quickly insert the percentage values that we'd like to use for either direction. And it makes it much easier than inputting the characteristics of our structure. We will now change models to demonstrate some new view tools and properties for cambering of steel beans, both composite and non-composite. 
Cambium was pre previously uh, available for both steel composite and non-composite beams. We have now expanded this uh, property to allow users um, with more control over the calculation of the camber deflection, the camber uh, application, as well as providing two new minimums for the beams. The camber was, uh, has always been controlled through the beam properties. So if we open the beam property dialog, we can see the camber. Can of see there's uh, additional controls for the proportion of the deflection of the beam. So we can control the percentage of self-weight, dead and imposed deflection. Have uh, apply our uh, maximum level camber, and we have introduced uh, the minimum for the requirement for the beam length, the and the uh, web thickness as well. And we also have the uh, require do not apply the camber if uh, lower than a specified value that was the only option previously available. We also have the option to apply our camber as an absolute value as previously with again, the minimums for beam length and web thickness, as well as a now proportion of the span. While you were previously able to apply camber to single beams through this uh, property window, or by selecting number of, a number of beams and applying the camber through the properties for multiple beams at once, we now have the option to do it through the review view. So we access the review view, show alter state as we did previously for impulse load reductions. We cannot change that to camber and we can graphically see which beams have cambered applied, uh, which beams have it off, and also the type of camber that has been applied for those beams. We can change the review to set on, off, or toggle, or a copy. When we toggle, it will switch between the on with the current characteristic that is uh, that has been set up and off. If we set to on, then we can see that the application can be selected and we can see which members have it on, which members have other details. If we hover over the member, then we can see the, the details for this cambering. For this, uh, this one I'm hovering over right now is uh, put to apply as value. And we can just take on different beams to set on the different deflections. If we change the type of application, for example, to value, we can change the camber that we want to apply. We can see beams that have other details. Those are still available to click, so we can change the characteristic of the camber that we're going to apply to those beams. Or we can just click on the new beams. Again, as a proportion of the span, we can set the proportion. We can see again all the details and apply the new item. Setting off, we just turn off the cambering. Again, for all these uh, modes, we can use our selection tools to quickly select multiple beams and apply as just shown here. Switch back to review. Now you can see that all the beams that were previously off that we just toggled, they moved straight to proportion of the deflection. That's the first option by default. And those beams that we had amended before, they just changed back to what we had already set. As with, um, as with uh, impulse load reductions, we also have the entire member. So in this case, we will have uh, single span beams. So it doesn't make a difference, but we do have the option for multi-span beams to apply to either the entire members, to, so all the spans, or just to individual spans. 
We also have the copy tool that will show us uh, our sources. Then we can select our source and then we can see uh, our valid targets. So beams that we can that have different Cambrian options and also the beams that are the same as the source. So this is uh, the same behavior as the regular copy tool, just now copying the camber. In addition, all those beams, all the beams that have camber applied, we can now also see in the tabular data over design summary, turn on steel, then we can see the camber. We can rearrange the table by camber and we can see which beams have uh, more, more camber down to no camber. This is all the time we have for today. Thank you for attending the webinar. You can read more about other features and behavior changes that we're gonna cover here in the release notes for Service Pack 1. Um, for now, we'll just open the floor for any questions that you may have.